Chapter 5 of The Three Hostages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sydney M. The Three Hostages by John Buchan. Chapter 5, The Thursday Club. We met in a room on the second floor of a little restaurant in Mervyn Street. A pleasant room, paneled in white, with big fires burning at each end. The club had its own cook and butler, and I swear a better dinner was never produced in London, starting with preposterously early plover's eggs and finishing with fruit from Berminster's houses. There were a dozen present, including myself, and of these, besides my host, I knew only Berminster and Sandy. Collot was there, and Pew, and a wizened little man who had just returned from bird hunting at the mouth of the Mackenzie. There was Palliser Yeats, the banker, who didn't look thirty, and fully loved the Arabian traveler who was really thirty and looked fifty. I was specially interested in Nightingale, a slim peering fellow with double glasses who had gone back to Greek manuscripts and his Cambridge fellowship after captaining a Bedouin tribe. Lytheon was there too, the attorney general who had been a private in the guards at the start of the war and had finished up a GSOI, a toughly built man with a pale face and very keen quizzical eyes. I should think there must have been more varied and solid brains in that dozen than you would find in an average parliament. Sandy was the last to arrive, and was greeted with a roar of joy. Everybody seemed to want to wring his hand and beat him on the back. He knew them all except Medina, and I was curious to see their meeting. Berminster did the introducing, and Sandy for a moment looked shy. I've been looking forward to this for years, Medina said and Sandy, after one glance at him, grinned sheepishly and stammered something polite. Berminster was chairman for the evening, a plump, jolly little man who had been a pal of Archie Roylance in the Air Force. The talk to begin with was nothing out of the common. It started with horses and the spring handicaps, and then got on to spring salmon fishing, for one man had been on the Helmsdale, another on the Naver, and two on the Tay. The fashion of the club was to have the conversation general, and there was very little talking in groups. I was next to Medina, between him and the Duke, and Sandy was on the other end of the oval table. He had not much to say, and more than once I caught his eyes watching Medina. Then, by and by, as was bound to happen, reminiscence began. Collot made me laugh with a story of how the Admiralty had a notion that sea lions might be useful to detect submarines. A number were collected and trained to swim after submarines to which fish were attached as bait, the idea being that they would come to associate the smell of submarines with food and go after a stranger. The thing shipwrecked on the artistic temperament. The beasts all came from the music halls and had names like Flossie and Sissy, so they couldn't be got to realize that there was a war on and were always going ashore without leave. That story started the ball rolling and by the time we had reached the port, the talk was like what you used to find in the smoking room of an East African coastal steamer, only a million times better. Everybody present had done and seen amazing things, and moreover, they had the brains and knowledge to orientate their experiences. It was no question of a string of yarns, but rather of the best kind of give-and-take conversation, when a man would buttress an argument by an apt recollection. I especially admired Medina. He talked little, but he made others talk, and his keen interest seemed to wake the best in everybody. I noticed that, as at our luncheon three days before, he drank only water. We talked, I remember, about the people who had gone missing, and whether any were likely still to turn up. Sandy told us about three British officers who had been in prison in Turkestan since the summer of 18, and had only just started home. He had met one of them at Marseille, and thought there might be others tucked away in those parts. Then someone spoke of how it was possible to drop off the globe for a bit and miss all that was happening. I said I had met an old prospector in Barberton in 1920 who had come down from Portuguese territory, and when I asked him what he had been doing in the war, he said, What war? Pugh said a fellow had just turned up in Hong Kong who had been a captive of Chinese pirates for eight years, and had never heard a word of our four years' struggle till he said something about the Kaiser to the skipper of the boat that picked him up. Then Sandy, as the newcomer, wanted news about Europe. 
I remember that Lytheon gave him his views on the malaise that France was suffering from, and that Palliser Yeats, who looked exactly like a rugby three-quarterback, enlightened him, and incidentally myself, on the matter of German reparations. Sandy was furious about the muddle in the Near East and the mishandling of Turkey. His view was that we were doing our best to hammer a much-divided Orient into a hostile unanimity. Lord, he cried, how I loathe our new manners in foreign policy. The old English way was to regard all foreigners as slightly childish and rather idiotic, and ourselves as the only grown-ups in a kindergarten world. That meant that we had a cool, detached view and did even-handed, unsympathetic justice. But now we have got into the nursery ourselves and are bare fighting on the floor. We take violent sides and make pets, and of course, if you are Phil something or other, you have got to be phobe something else. It is all wrong. We are becoming balkanized. We would have drifted into politics if Pew had not asked him his opinion of Gandhi. That led him into an exposition of the meaning of the fanatic, a subject on which he was well qualified to speak, for he had consorted with most varieties. He is always in the technical sense mad, that is, his mind is tilted from its balance, and since we live by balance, he is a wrecker, a crowbar in the machinery. His power comes from the appeal he makes to the imperfectly balanced, and as these are never the majority, his appeal is limited. But there is one kind of fanatic whose strength comes from balance, from a lunatic balance. You cannot say that there is any one thing abnormal about him, for he is all abnormal. He is as balanced as you or me, but so to speak, in a fourth-dimensional world. That kind of man has no logical gaps in his creed. Within his insane postulates, he is brilliantly sane. Take Lenin, for instance. That's the kind of fanatic I'm afraid of. Lytheon asked how such a man got his influence. You say that there is no crazy spot in him which appeals to a crazy spot in other people. He appeals to the normal, said Sandy solemnly, to the perfectly sane. He offers reason, not visions. In any case, his visions are reasonable. In ordinary times, he will not be heard, because, as I say, his world is not our world. But let there come a time of great suffering or discontent, when the mind of the ordinary man is in desperation, and the rational fanatic will come by his own. When he appeals to the sane, and the sane respond, revolutions begin. Pew nodded his head as if he agreed. Your fanatic, of course, must be a man of genius. Of course, and genius of that kind is happily rare. When it exists, its possessor is the modern wizard. The old necromancer fiddled away with cabalistic signs and crude chemicals and got nowhere. The true wizard is the man who works by spirit, on spirit. We are only beginning to realize the strange crannies of the human soul. The real magician, if he turned up today, wouldn't bother about drugs and dopes. He would dabble in far more deadly methods, the compulsion of a fiery nature over the limp things that men call their minds. He turned to Pew. You remember the man we used to call Ram Das in the war? I never knew his right name. Rather, said Pew, the fellow who worked for us in San Francisco. He used to get big sums from the agitators and pay them into the British exchequer, less his commission of ten percent. Stout fellow, Berminster exclaimed approvingly. Well, Ram Das used to discourse to me on this subject. He was as wise as a serpent and as loyal as a dog and he saw a lot of things coming that we are just beginning to realize. He said that the great offenses of the future would be psychological, and he thought the governments should get busy about it and prepare their defense. What a jolly sight it would be, all of the high officials sitting down to little primers. But there was a sense in what he said. He considered that the most deadly weapon in the world was the power of mass persuasion, and he wanted to meet it at the source, by getting at the mass persuader. His view was that every spellbinder had got something like Samson's hair, which was the key of his strength, and that if this were tampered with, he could be made innocuous. He would have had us make pets of the prophets and invite them to government house. You remember the winter of 1917 when the Bolsheviks were making trouble in Afghanistan and their stuff was filtering through into India? Well, Ram Das claimed the credit of stopping that game by his psychological dodges. He looked across suddenly at Medina. You know the frontier. Did you ever come across the guru that lived at the foot of the Shansi Pass as you go over to Kaikand? Medina shook his head. I never traveled that way. Why? Sandy seemed disappointed. Ram Das used to speak of him. I hoped you might have met him. The Club Madiera was being passed round, and there was a little silence while we sipped it. 
It was certainly a marvelous wine, and I noticed with pain Medina's abstinence. You really are missing a lot, you know, Berminster boomed in his jolly voice, and for a second all the company looked Medina's way. He smiled and lifted his glass of water. Sit vini abstemius qui germeniuma tentat at hominum petit dominatum, he said. Nightingale translated, meaning that you must be a pussyfoot if you would be a big man. There was a chorus of protest, and Medina again lifted his glass. I'm only joking. I haven't a scrap of policy or principle in the matter. I don't happen to like the stuff, that's all. I fancy that the only two scholars among us were Nightingale and Sandy. I looked at the latter and was surprised by the change in his face. It had awakened to the most eager interest. His eyes, which had been staring at Medina, suddenly met mine, and I read in them not only interest, but disquiet. Berminster was delivering a spirited defense of Bacchus, and the rest joined in, but Sandy took the other side. There's a good deal in that Latin tag, he said. There are places in the world where total abstinence is reckoned a privilege. Did you ever come across the Uli tribe up the Karakoram Way? He was addressing Medina. No? Well, the next time you meet a man in the guides, ask him about them, for they are curiosity. They're Mohammedan and so should by rights be abstainers, but they're a drunken set of sweeps, and the most priest-ridden community on earth. Drinking is not only a habit among them, it's an obligation, and their weekly tamasha would make Falstaff take the pledge. But their priests, they're a kind of theocracy, are strict teetotal. It is their privilege and the secret of their power. When one of them has to be degraded, he is filled compulsorily, full of wine. That's your, how does the thing go, your hominum dominitus? From that moment, I found the evening go less pleasantly. Medina was as genial as ever, but something seemed to have affected Sandy's temper, and he became positively grumpy. Now and then he contradicted a man too sharply for good manners, but for the most part he was silent, smoking his pipe and answering his neighbors in monosyllables. About eleven, I began to feel it was time to leave, and Medina was of the same opinion. He asked me to walk with him, and I gladly accepted for I did not feel inclined to go to bed. As I was putting on my coat, Sandy came up. Come to the club, Dick, he said. I want to talk to you. His manner was so peremptory that I opened my eyes. Sorry, I said. I've promised to walk home with Medina. Oh, damn Medina, he said. Do as I ask or you'll be sorry for it. I wasn't feeling very pleased with Sandy, especially as Medina was near enough to hear what he said so I told him rather coldly that I didn't intend to go back on my arrangement. He turned and marched out, cannoning at the doorway into Berminster, to whom he did not apologize. That nobleman rubbed his shoulder ruefully. Old Sandy hasn't got used to his corn yet, he laughed. Looks as if the Madeira had touched up his liver. It was a fine still March night with a good moon, and as we walked along Piccadilly, I was feeling cheerful. The good dinner I had eaten and the good wine I had drunk played their part in this mood, and there was also the satisfaction of having dined with good fellows and having been admitted into pretty select company. I felt my liking for Medina enormously increase, and I had the unworthy sense of superiority which a man gets from seeing an old friend, whom he greatly admires, behave rather badly. I was considering what had ailed Sandy when Medina raised the subject. A wonderful fellow, Arbuthbot, he said. I have wanted to meet him for several years, and he is certainly up to my expectations. But he has been quite long enough abroad. A mind as keen as his, if it doesn't have the company of its equals, is in danger of getting viewy. What he said tonight was amazingly interesting, but I thought it a little fantastic. I agreed, but the hint of criticism was enough to revive my loyalty. All the same, there's usually something in his most extravagant theories. I've seen him write when all the sober knowledgeable people were wrong. That I can well believe, he said. You know him well? Pretty well. We've been in some queer places together. The memory of those queer places came back to me as we walked across Berkeley Square. The West End of London at night always affected me with a sense of the immense solidity of our civilization. These great houses, lit and shuttered and secure, seemed the exact opposite of the world of half-lights and perils in which I had sometimes journeyed. I thought of them as I thought of Foss Manor, as sanctuaries of peace. But tonight I felt differently towards them. I wondered what was going on at the back of those heavy doors. Might not terror and mystery lurk behind that barricade as well as in tent and slum? 
I suddenly had a picture of a plump face all screwed up with fright, muffled beneath the bedclothes. I had imagined that Medina lived in chambers or a flat, but we stopped before a substantial house in Hill Street. You coming in? The night's young and there's time for a pipe. I had no wish to go to bed, so I followed him as he opened the front door with a latch key. He switched on a light, which lit the first landing of the staircase, but left the hall in dusk. It seemed to be a fine place full of cabinets, the gilding of which flickered dimly. We ascended thickly carpeted stairs, and on the landing he switched off the first light and switched on another, which lit a further flight. I had the sensation of mounting to a great height in a queer shadowy world. This is a big house for a bachelor, I observed. I have a lot of stuff, books and pictures and things, and I like it round me. He opened a door and ushered me into an enormous room which must have occupied the whole space on that floor. It was oblong with deep bays at each end, and it was lined from floor to ceiling with books. Books, too, were piled on the tables and sprawled on a big flat couch which was drawn up before the fire. It wasn't an ordinary gentleman's library provided by the bookseller at so much a yard. It was the working collection of a scholar, and the books had that used look which makes them the finest tapestry for a room. The place was lit with lights on small tables, and on a big desk under a reading lamp were masses of papers and various volumes with paper slips in them. It was a workshop as well as a library. A servant entered unsummoned and put a tray of drinks on a side table. He was dressed like an ordinary butler, but I guessed that he had not spent much of his life in service. The heavy jowl, the small eyes, the hair cut straight round the nape of the neck, the swollen muscles about the shoulder and upper arm told me the profession he had once followed. The man had been in the ring, and not so very long ago. I wondered at Medina's choice, for a pug is not the kind of servant I would choose myself. Nothing more, Odell, said Medina. You can go to bed. I will let Sir Richard out. He placed me in a long armchair and held the siphon while I mixed myself a very weak whiskey and soda. Then he sat opposite me, across the hearth rug in a tall old-fashioned chair, which he pulled forward from his writing table. The servant in leaving had turned out all the lights except one at his right hand, which vividly lit up his face, and which, since the fire had burned low, made the only bright patch in the room. I stretched my legs comfortably and puffed at my pipe, wondering how I would have the energy to get up and go home. The long, dim shelves where creamy vellum and morocco ran out of the dusk into darkness had an odd effect on me. I was visited again by the fancies which had occupied me coming through Berkeley Square. I was inside one of those massive sheltered houses, and lo and behold, it was as mysterious as the aisles of a forest. Books, books, old books, full of forgotten knowledge. I was certain that if I had the scholarship to search the grave rows, I would find out wonderful things. I was thirsty, so I drank off my whiskey and soda, and was just adding a little more soda water from the siphon at my elbow when I looked towards Medina. There was that in his appearance which made me move my glass so that a thin stream of liquid fell on my sleeve. The patch was still damp next morning. His face, brilliantly lit up by the lamp, seemed to be also lit from within. It was not his eyes or any one feature that enthralled me, for I did not notice any details. Only the odd lighting seemed to detach his head from its environment, so that it hung in the air like a planet in the sky, full of intense brilliance and power. It is not very easy to write down what happened. For twelve hours afterwards, I remembered nothing, only that I had been very sleepy and must have been poor company and had soon got up to go. But that was not the real story. It was what the man had willed that I should remember, and because my own will was not really mastered, I remembered other things in spite of him, remembered them hazily like a drunkard's dream. The head seemed to swim in the center of pale converging lines. These must have been the bookshelves which, in that part of the room, were full of works bound in old vellum. My eyes were held by two violet pinpoints of light, which were so bright that they hurt me. I tried to shift my gaze, but I could only do that by screwing round my head towards the dying fire. The movement demanded a great effort, for every muscle in my body seemed drugged with lethargy. As soon as I looked away from the light, I regained some possession of my wits. I felt that I must be in for some sickness, and had a moment of bad fright. It seemed to be my business to keep my eyes on the shadows in the hearth, for where darkness was, there I found some comfort. 
I was as afraid of the light before me as a child of a buggy. I thought that if I said something I should feel better, but I didn't seem to have the energy to get a word out. Curiously enough, I felt no fear of Medina. He didn't seem to be in the business. It was that disembodied light that scared me. Then I heard a voice speaking, but still I didn't think of Medina. Hanny, it said. You are Richard Hanny? Against my will I slewed my eyes round, and there hung that intolerable light burning into my eyeballs and my soul. I found my voice now, for it seemed to be screwed out of me, and I said, yes, like an automaton. I felt my wits and my sense slipping away under that glare, but my main discomfort was physical, the flaming control of the floating brightness, not face or eyes, but a dreadful overmastering aura. I thought, if at that moment you could call any process of my mind thought, that if I could only link it onto some material thing, I should find relief. With a desperate effort, I seemed to make out the line of a man's shoulder and the back of a chair. Let me repeat that I never thought of Medina, for he had been wiped clean out of my world. You are Richard Hanny, said the voice. Repeat, I am Richard Hanny. The words came out of my mouth involuntarily. I was concentrating all my wits on the comforting outline of the chair back, which was beginning to be less hazy. The voice spoke again, but till this moment you have been nothing. There was no Richard Hanny before. Now when I bid you, you begin your life. You remember nothing. You have no past. I remember nothing, said my voice, but as I spoke I knew I lied, and that knowledge was my salvation. I have been told more than once by doctors who dabbled in the business that I was the most hopeless subject for hypnotism that they ever struck. One of them once said that I was about as unsympathetic as Table Mountain. I must suppose that the intractable bedrock of commonplaceness in me now met the something which was striving to master me and repelled it. I felt abominably helpless. My voice was not my own. My eyes were tortured and aching, but I had recovered my mind. I seemed to be repeating a lesson at someone's dictation. I said I was Richard Hannay, who had just come from South Africa on his first visit to England. I knew no one in London and had no friends. Had I heard of Colonel Arbuthnot? I had not. Or the Thursday Club? I had not. Or the war? Yes, but I had been in Angola most of the time and had never fought. I had money? Yes, a fair amount, which was in such and such a bank and such and such investments. I went on repeating the stuff as glibly as a parrot but all the while I knew I lied. Something deep down in me was insisting that I was Sir Richard Hanny, K.C.B., who had commanded a division in France, and was the squire of Foss Manor, the husband of Mary, and the father of Peter John. Then the voice seemed to give orders. I was to do this and that, and I repeated them docilely. I was no longer in the least scared. Someone or something was trying to play monkey tricks with my mind, but I was the master of that though my voice seemed to belong to an alien gramophone and my limbs were stupidly weak. I wanted above all things to be allowed to sleep. I think I must have slept for a little, for my last recollection of that queer sedirant is that the unbearable light had gone and the ordinary lamps of the room were switched on. Medina was standing by the dead fire and another man beside him, a slim man with a bent back and a lean gray face. The second man was only there for a moment, but he looked at me closely, and I thought Medina spoke to him and laughed. Then I was being helped by Medina into my coat and conducted downstairs. There were two bright lights in the street, which made me want to lie down on the curb and sleep. I woke about ten o'clock next morning in my bedroom at the club, feeling like nothing on earth. I had a bad headache, my eyes seemed to be back with white fire, and my legs were full of weak pains as if I had influenza. It took me several minutes to realize where I was, and when I wondered what had brought me to such a state, I could remember nothing. Only a preposterous litany ran in my brain, the name Dr. Newhover and an address in Wimple Street. I concluded glumly that that for a man in my condition was a useful recollection, but where I had got it, I hadn't an idea. The events of the night before were perfectly clear. I recalled every detail of the Thursday Club dinner, Sandy's brusqueness, my walk back with Medina, my admiration of his great library. I remember that I had been drowsy there, and thought that I had probably bored him, but I was utterly at a loss to account for my wretched condition. It could not have been the dinner, or the wine, for I had not drunk much, and in any case I have a head like cast iron, 
or the weak whiskey and soda in Medina's house. I staggered to my feet and looked at my tongue in the glass. It was all right, so there could be nothing the matter with my digestion. You are to understand that the account I have just written was pieced together as events came back to me, and that at 10 a.m. the next morning, I remembered nothing of it, nothing but the incidents up to my sitting down in Medina's library and the name and address of a doctor I had never heard of. I concluded that I must have gotten some infernal germ, probably botulism, and was in for a bad illness. I wondered dismally what kind of fool I had made of myself before Medina, and still more dismally what was going to happen to me. I decided to wire for Mary when I had seen a doctor, and to get as soon as possible into a nursing home. I had never had an illness in my life except malaria, and I was as nervous as a cat. But after I had had a cup of tea, I felt a little better and inclined to get up. A cold bath relieved my headache and I was able to shave and dress. It was while I was shaving that I observed the first thing which made me puzzle about the events of the previous evening. The valet who attended to me had put out the contents of my pockets on the dressing table. My keys, watch, loose silver, note case, and my pipe and pouch. Now I carry my pipe in a little leather case and being very punctilious in my habits, I invariably put it back in the case when it is empty. But the case was not there, though I remember laying it on the table beside me in Medina's room, and moreover, the pipe was still half full of unsmoked tobacco. I rang for the man and learned that he had found the pipe in the pocket of my dinner jacket, but no case. He was positive, for he knew my ways and had been surprised to find my pipe so untidily pocketed. I had a light breakfast in the coffee room, and as I ate it, I kept wondering as to what exactly I had been doing the night before. Odd little details were coming back to me, in particular a recollection of some great effort which had taken all the strength out of me. Could I have been drugged? Not the Thursday Club Madeira. Medina's whiskey and soda? The idea was nonsense. In any case, a drugged man does not have a clean tongue the next morning. I interviewed the night porter, for I thought he might have something to tell me. Did you notice what hour I came home last night? I asked. It would be this morning, Sir Richard, the man replied with the suspicion of a grin. About half past three it would be, or twenty minutes to four. God bless my soul, I exclaimed. I had no notion it was so late. I sat up talking with a friend. You must have been asleep in the car, Sir Richard, for the chauffeur had to wake you, and you were that drowsy I thought I'd better take you upstairs myself. The bedrooms on the top floor is not that easy found. I didn't drop a pipe case, I asked. No, sir. The man's discreet face revealed that he thought I had been dining too well, but was not inclined to blame me for it. By luncheon time, I had decided that I was not going to be ill, for there was no longer anything the matter with my body except a certain stiffness in the joints and the ghost of a headache behind my eyes. But my mind was in a precious confusion. I had stayed in Medina's room till after three, and had not been conscious of anything that happened thereafter, say, half-past eleven. I had left finally in such a state that I had forgotten my pipe case, and had arrived at the club in somebody's car, probably Medina's, so sleepy that I had to be escorted upstairs, and had awoke so ill that I thought I had botulism. What in heaven's name had happened? I fancy that the fact that I had resisted the influence brought to bear on me with my mind, though tongue and limbs had been helpless, enabled me to remember what the wielder of the influence had meant to be forgotten. At any rate, bits of that strange scene began to come back. I remembered the uncanny brightness, remembered it not with fear, but with acute indignation. I vaguely recalled that I had repeated nonsense to someone's dictation, but what it was I could not yet remember. The more I thought of it, the angrier I grew. Medina must have been responsible, though to connect him with it seemed ridiculous when I thought of what I had seen of him. Had he been making me the subject of some scientific experiment? If so, it was infernal impertinence. Anyhow, it had failed. That was a solve to my pride, for I had kept my head through it. The doctor had been right who had compared me with Table Mountain. I had got thus far in my reflections when I recollected that which put a different complexion on the business. Suddenly, I remembered the circumstances in which I had made Medina's acquaintance. From him, Tom Greenslade had heard the three facts which fitted in with the jingle which was the key to the mystery that I was sworn to unravel. Hitherto, I had never thought of this dazzling figure except as an ally. Was it possible that he might be an enemy? The turnabout was too violent for my mind to achieve it in one moment. I swore to myself that Medina was straight, 
and that it was sheer mania to believe that a gentleman and a sportsman could ever come within hailing distance of the hideous underworld which MacGillivray had revealed to me. But Sandy had not quite taken to him. I thanked my stars that anyhow I had said nothing to him about my job. I did not really believe that there was any doubt about him, but I realized that I must walk very carefully. And then another idea came to me. Hypnotism had been tried on me, and it had failed. But those who tried it on me must believe from my behavior that it had succeeded. If so, somehow and somewhere they would act on that belief. It was my business to encourage it. I was sure enough of myself to think that now I was forewarned. No further hypnotic experiments could seriously affect me. But let them show their game. Let me pretend to be helpless wax in their hands. Who they were, I still had to find out. I had a great desire to get hold of Sandy and talk it over. But though I rung up several of his layers, I could not find him. Then I decided to see Dr. Newhover, for I was certain that that name had come to me out of the medley of last night. So I telephoned and made an appointment with him for that afternoon, and four o'clock saw me starting out to walk to Wimple Street. End of chapter five, The Thursday Club. Recording by Sydney M.